Hello, my name is Brian DeLevy and I'm an Associate Professor of Design at the University of Colorado Denver. And I am also currently a doctoral student in higher education equity and leadership. The, the information presented here is part of a paper being published by the same name in Rehearsing Racial Equity, a critical anthology on anti-racism and repair in the arts. So to begin with the catalyst of this idea and presentation, in 1968, Dorothy Jackson wrote an article entitled The Black Experience of Graphic Design for Print Magazine. For the article, Jackson was asked to investigate and interview five black designers during what was then thought of as the apex of the civil rights movement about the frustration and opportunity in a field where flesh color means pink, and that is in design. At the time of the article's publication, only 1-2% to 2 of all designers in the profession were black. The design industry then and now includes clients and practitioners and is highly selective in choosing its participants. Its selectivity may be due to a variety of factors, including the costly education preparation uh, and professional participation and subsequent competition in the marketplace. Fifty years after the initial publication, Print Magazine in 2016 revisited the topic of diversity within the design industry and again interviewed prominent black designers about what had changed and what had remained the same since the initial publication. They also asked what needs to happen next to diversify the design industry as a whole. One of the designers interviewed was Bobby Martin, um, co-founder of Champions Design in New York City. Martin says, quote, it's hard to believe that this article is written in 68. More than 50 years later, very little has changed. According to the 19, 2019 design census curated by AIGA and Google, black men and women make up just 3% of the design industry. We are 13% of the total U.S. population. The failure to close the gap is a failure of our educational institutions, our industry organizations, and the design profession as a whole. The data Martin was referring to comes from the 2019 AIGA survey with 9,500 respondents from uh, U.S. design professionals. And in that survey, they found that 8% of designers identified as Latinx and only 3% as African American. The Black Lives Matter movement its rise not only has refocused attention on systemic racism, but also on the roles and responsibilities secular and non-secular institutions have in combating, addressing systematic privilege, and fostering a more inclusive and equitable society. The questions raised by the BLM movement have also extended into higher education, the arts, and design regarding social and professional responsibility. When thinking about diversity in design practice and approaches to increasing diversity industry, uh, diversity industry so it reflects the makeup of our country, we need to look at how our structures invite or limit diversity within academia itself. This has gotten uh, brought me to the following two questions. What role does personal design, personal discipline, excuse me, what role does personal discipline and institutional bias play in design curriculum decision making? And what can design programs do to actively and effectively challenge hegemonic structures to engage better and promote equi more equitable and diverse forms of education? To, these, to investigate these questions, it's useful to apply a critical race theory lens. Briefly speaking, CRT is about highlighting how structures and systems contain systematic racism and implicit or non-implicit bias and as a tool to which to evaluate and address these issues. Critical race theory stems uh, from the work of legal scholars in the 70s who, after seeing significant advances in the civil rights movement for people of colors in the 60s, saw the movement slowing almost to a complete halt. In response to this puzzling shift in progress, a group of legal scholars began to question the utility of the legal system to enact justice outside of existing power systems and created what was then called critical legal studies. 
In a Prostin scholarship that was primarily concerned with questioning the U.S. legal system's role in maintaining and legitimizing social injustice and systems of oppression. Today, due to its ability to highlight discrimination stemming from the intersections of race and difference, such as ethnicity, language, gender, sexual orientation, and social class, CRT has proven useful in the examination of the conscious and unconscious roles of racism within curriculum and pedagogy, while also highlighting alternative perspectives, approaches, and policies. So briefly, I'll discuss the tenets of critical race theory. Um, the first of which is the acceptance of the centrality and permanence of racism. The notion of the permanence of racism suggests that racist hierarchical structures govern all political, economic, and social domains, particularly in the United States. Such structures allocate the privileging of whites and the subsequent other and of people of color in all areas, including education. The second tenet is interest converges theory which is the people of color in the United States may make significant social, political, and economic progress when their interests align with those in power and those interests to serve, serve for the benefit of both groups. So this is essentially saying that there is no advance in non-whites unless it benefits the majority. So for example, diversity and cultural awareness classes were not considered vital to education until universities felt that they'd be beneficial to increasing their enrollment and the future success of white students. Another tenet is that of intersectionality. Although critical race theory centers on race and racism, CRT recognizes that racial identity and racism intersect with other subordinate identities, such as gender, class, religion, ability, disability, and sexual orientation and forms of oppression, for example, sexism, homophobia, and ableism, ableism, to influence the people of color's lived experiences. For example, when examining issues that affect women who are not white, it is important to acknowledge that there are many related and not related issues and challenges to that particular group. Another tenet is that of whiteness as property. In her essay, Critical Characteristics of Whiteness as Property, Sylvia Harris examines how whiteness, initially constructed as a form of racial identity, evolved into a form of property, and still to this day is protected by American law. Another tenet is experiential knowledge and counter storytelling. Counter storytelling attempts to help people to understand what life is like for others and invites, invites them into new and unfamiliar worlds. CRT sees counter storytelling as having the potential and responsibility to promote understanding, acknowledgement, and empathy. And lastly, a critical, excuse me, a commit, commitment to social justice. CRT's ultimate goal is to create a vision of society where all groups have full and equal participation in a society that is shaped to meet their needs and that the distribution of resources is equitable to all members in the, within that society in a safe and secure manner. In order for CRT to deepen, um, to deepen the understanding and effect of change, it requires both a shift in context and vantage point by everyone and evaluation of all knowledge, including or particularly people of color. It also requires a realist view that American society is a product of its history, and a large part of that history and our contemporary experience centers around the dominant role, be it conscious or unconscious, of racism. And lastly, it requires an acknowledgement that racist hierarchical structures govern all political, economic, and social domains, and as such, inherently privileges whites. Where CRT becomes useful in looking at how dominant groups need to maintain power structures in American society, such as that in education, it's, um, it's also useful to academia, pardon me. So where CRT becomes useful in looking at how dominant groups need to maintain power structures in American society, 
that privileges whites over all social groups. In academia and design education, this is often through the guise of tradition and curriculum, or what is referred to as curricular hegemony. In many ways, curriculum is about culture. Many nationally recognized design programs are steeped in history and success with unchanging traditions, strong cultures, and faculty members with long tenures. While a strong culture may provide a curriculum that exudes a strong sense of identity and expectation, it also displays a large number of shared assumptions by members who have been considered there for a long period of time. By and large, professors have almost complete autonomy over curricular matters and often wield their influence over teaching practices as a basis of personal power and beliefs. As such, traditions, fears, beliefs, and values can have a direct and lasting impact on curricular matters and, and students. Historically, university and design programs have focused on producing knowledgeable professionals who can meet employers' needs and maximize their futures. These complementary and contradictory roles are emblematic of higher education and design programs challenges when engaging in conversations about race, pedagogy, and responsibility. The pedagogical traditions of design are recognized by academics because of the stability they provide and the success that they have historically demonstrated. And in post-secondary education, educators serve as instructors, trainers, and as practices, artists and designers. However, due to its history and tradition, many faculty members teach as they were taught and may consciously or unconsciously create environments that prioritize or legitimize certain kinds of knowledge and techniques of, over others. Additionally, because of the authority of faculty and the credibility of those, their traditions and history, non-majority students often feel disempowered to challenge or question how or if these systems perpetuate forms of structured and institutional racism. By its very nature, curriculum excludes diverse perspectives and allows the rights of use and enjoyment via a Eurocentric lens that aligns more with white people's experiences and power. It also imposes an ideology upon students that present a view of the world that is easy to accept because it is seen as right or correct and therefore becomes the dominant knowledge. In his paper, Language and Ideology, J.B. Thompson discusses how curriculum presents a process of legitimization that seeks to justify and exercise power by those who possess it and strives to reconcile others to the fact that they do not. Teaching and honoring methods, theories, and historical movements such as Art Nouveau, the Bauhaus, or postmodernism established a distorted lens through which non-whites view their place in the world and degrade and devalues their experiences, thereby undermining their conceptions of self, personal experience, their histories, language, and knowledge. The effects of traditions and curriculums can be seen in how portfolio reviews are constructed and used, and in the forms of expression that are encouraged and valued during critiques. From a CRT perspective, the intent and message of these hidden curriculums are clear. The dominant and most important historical and artistic traditions of this country are steeped in wealthy, elite, and culturally refined traditions of Western Europe, and all other cultures are secondary in importance to these experiences. Marginalized students are forced into a position where they must accept these ideas and to confront un Resolvable, the unresolvable paradox of empowerment where they either lose themselves by accepting the dominant knowledge or are pushed to the borders by rejecting it. Neo Margolis noted that the hidden curriculum is often understood to represent the conscious and unconscious socialization of students through norms, values, and belief systems and is embedded in the curriculum and imparted to students through daily routines, curricular content, and social relationships. For example, students who did not come from privileged backgrounds and have access to art, high school art programs or are able to attend summer camps or pre-collegiate programs often don't even know how to navigate the university, much less their departments. They also may not know that there are resources available to help them or for that matter that they can even ask professors for help when needed. 
From a CRFT perspective, this is because processes and policies are established in higher education that ensure the marginalization of groups so they do not have the tools necessary to exceed, even if they put in the work necessary. Additionally, curriculums and university structures operate with a disposition towards a canon. Knowledge and information that has been passed throughout generations, ensuring whiteness remains embedded and upheld. Returning to the initial question posed um, in this paper, often we as academics and designers take our privilege for granted, be it our gender, race, or education. If we are to evolve our thinking and approach in our approaches to education, diversity, and professional design practice, we will need to expand our perspectives when thinking about our students, our organizations, and the profession itself. When thinking about addressing and answering these questions, we must understand our fears of appearing biased or lacking the personal lived experience necessary or the necessary knowledge to address these issues adequately. However, to empower students to become the designers who diversify the profession and create a more equitable, inclusive society, we need to push for a more thoughtful approach to design education. The journey begins by asking some fundamental questions. What can we do to promote a more inclusive and diverse environment? What, per, what personal biases are driving some of our behaviors and decisions? How can we better engage, represent, and promote women, people of color, and underrepresented minorities in all aspects of this design? Though I do not assume to have the answers, I think the following provides some sound context for discussion. Beginning with addressing color blindness. Colorblind approaches display a lack of consciousness about how academia programs are organized and educate. By consciously acknowledging the need for diversity in design programs can actively begin to acknowledge their role in perpetuating structural racism and reevaluate how structures and approaches to design education may inadvertently subject non-majority students to an unwelcoming academic culture. Another thing, uh, for example, instead of viewing students as not having the tools needed to navigate the system, provide resources, mentorship, and support spaces needed to include rather than exclude students. Another thing to be considered is the deficit model. In her paper, Whose Culture Has Capital, a critical race theory discussion of community cultural wealth, Tara Yasso discusses how there is often an assumption that people of color lack the necessary knowledge, skills, abilities, and cultural capital required for academic and social mobility. Instead of pursuing a deficit model, Yasso suggests that schools see communities of color uh, colors natural wealth through at least six forms of capital, such as aspirational, navigational, social, linguistic, familial, and resistant. By valuing students' differences, design programs can reevaluate how their structures may be elitist, elitist and potentially racist and limit transform the transformational experiences they offer. Culturally responsive education is premised on the idea that culture is, culture is central to student learning. Multicultural education is a process of comprehensive school reform and basic education for all students. Both culturally responsive education and multicultural education offer frameworks for pedagogical and structural change. They also challenge and reject racism and other forms of discrimination in schools and society by accepting and affirming the pluralism the students, their communities, and teachers reflect. In their paper, Breaking Down Silos, Teaching for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Across Disciplines, Harwell et al. state that traditionally common learning outcomes of equity, diversity, and inclusion education are going to organize in three dimensions, awareness, knowledge, and skills. However, more, more recently, scholars and educators have stressed the importance of a fourth objective, action. Though Hartwell et al. discuss these outcomes from a perspective of students, they provide insight into how digital education can reduce barriers and increase diversity within its professional ranks. The first dimension, awareness, refers to academia's need to become aware of its biases and assumptions about others and make a conscious effort to pedagogically and structurally correct those through an openness and to learning about others. The second dimension, knowledge, refers to the need 
for design education to understand how hegemonic pedagogy has perpetuated symbolic racism and denied existing patterns of racial inequalities and consequently sent implicit messages to minorities about what constitutes valid knowledge and who are the dominant and subordinate classes. The third dimension, skills, refers to the academy's need to develop the ability to interact justly and effectively with people from various cultures and backgrounds. The final dimension, action, asks design and design education to fully create, commit to creating change and social injustice through its pedagogical practices, regardless of their backgrounds. Design, both in terms of an education and a practice, is often seen as an approach to solving problems. And through that guise, it has been a significant factor in shaping human experience. And I believe by looking internally, design education can be a fundamental force in broadening and diversing its ranks and forms of communication. Thank you.